morning, everyone. Welcome to Albert Christian Church this morning. Do we have any birthdays to celebrate today? Do we have any anniversaries to celebrate? Yeah, we never did get you up there. Well, yeah, kind of recognize that guy too. <clears throat> you guys don't have to come up. Let's do the birthday salutation. Many of the day of thy birth, may sunshine and gladness be given. And may the dear Father prepare them for a beautiful birthday in heaven. <clears throat> if there's no, yeah, let's give them a break. <clears throat> Is there no anniversaries? Okay, we'll continue on with the service. You guys can have a seat if you like. Sure is an awesome morning to be together and worship and something to be real grateful for, I think. Uh, there's a few announcements. Kind of some last minute deal. I guess my sister hurt her foot last night and isn't going to be here for her baby shower. So I'm sure you guys all know, but it's going to be next weekend. And then Potluck got moved because of Easter to the third Sunday. And uh, if you got all your pictures done, which you should have, because they just finished them up here yesterday, they're going to be emailing them in the next week or two. And if you got any problems downloading it or or what have you, get with Cody Schroeder. He'll help you get them lined out. So let's uh, let's go to God in God in prayer. Father God, it's it's such a great great time here, and uh, I thank you for gathering us all together, for getting us here safely. I know a lot of us have, have come here with joys and sorrows, and I pray that this is a time that we lay those down at your feet, that our minds are renewed, refreshed, opened, <clears throat> that we leave here with a bright perspective and hope. We're able to find more strength and uh, continue to show others what it's like to follow you. I just pray that you be with us, renew our hearts, and we pray all this in your name. Amen. This morning I was drinking coffee and Kelly says, did you see the verse for the day? And I said, no, I hadn't. And I said, well, read it to me. And she read it to me. And I thought, well, that's pretty fitting for how we've been feeling this week. And so I pulled that verse up in the Bible and then I thought I'd read the rest of it to keep it in context. This is in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. It'll start verse 7. And Paul says, To keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassing great revelations, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. This is my favorite part because I don't know how many people that would do this. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about in my weakness so that Christ's power may rest in me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong.
Your goodness is running after 
for communion and I spent a lot of time thinking about this time only because I got to write about it but it uh it's amazing how many lessons we can take for from what Christ has done for us I've titled this something you don't want to have you ever gone through something you don't want to <laughs> or maybe you're going through something right now that you don't want to I know I have, and I'm pretty certain everyone here has too. In fact, I could say with almost certainty that if you talk with someone long enough, you will find out they have gone through something that they didn't want to. Sometimes we find ourselves going through a situation we may have very well dreaded going through our entire lives. Or it's an instant surprise. And we're saying to ourselves, why is this happening? Sometimes we spend so much energy trying to prevent what we don't want to happen, and it still happens. We find ourselves comparing what we have to go through to what other people don't have to go through. And if we are not careful, we find ourselves in a resentful, victimized state. When this happens, we must remind ourselves that there is always someone who will gladly trade their problems for yours. Then there is the inevitable question. Why does it have to be this way? I have a theory. It's supposed to be this way. And it's on purpose. Because how else is our faith to be tested? Nothing else is going to make people turn to God and say, please. Romans 5, 
verses 3 through 4, says this, And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that a tribulation produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. A little side note here, I, I now know why growing up when I had to do chores I didn't particularly like, I was told it builds character. Here's where I have found strength. Knowing Jesus went through something he didn't want to. The Son of God had to go through something, A, he knew was going to happen, and B, was not looking forward to it. If Jesus Christ himself had to, then it should stand to reason that we all should too. I like the saying that more is caught than taught. Meaning we can sometimes learn more by watching someone than by our, what they are saying. In Matthew chapter 26, verses 36 through 46, we get to watch Jesus deal with knowing of his soon-to-be agonizing death. Jesus says in verse 38, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. He embraced the emotion, and then he did what a lot of us do. He asked God if there was any way for this not to happen. In verse 39, Jesus says, My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, not as I will, but as you will. After he prayed and accepted that there was no way for this to change, he owned it and embraced it. When he was arrested, one of his companions drew a sword out to defend him, and Jesus said, Put your sword away. Do you not think I can call on my Father, and he will at once put at my disposal more than twelve legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled? They say it must happen this way. Jesus had to go through this so we could have everlasting life. Unlike all of us, he could have easily gotten out of it. But he chose not to. It makes me wonder what all of us would choose if we were given the option. I think Jesus' death is a powerful example of how to deal with things we don't want to go through. To show us to embrace the hardship because unlike Christ, we don't know the impact that we might have on someone watching us go through it. Might we ponder on the gift we have been given because of Christ's refusal to avoid the torture he knew he would go through so that we could have everlasting life? Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we are so humbled by the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. And uh, as Zach said, uh, he, he, Jesus knew what was coming, but uh, he didn't back out of it. He gave his life, and, uh, he gave, and it was all for us that we might have uh, forgiveness from our sins. He shed his blood and, and did that for us. And, uh, we just thank, we're so thankful, and uh, we just pray that uh, we'll apply that to our own lives, that, uh, that we'll uh, sacrifice also that, uh, to follow Jesus. We just ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Let us pray. Lord and Heavenly Father, it's at this time of the service we give back to you a portion of uh, what you've blessed us with. Lord, you promised that uh, you will supply all of our needs, maybe not our wants, but our needs. The more we trust in you, the more that we obey you, the more that you will entrust with us in this, in this earth. Lord, uh, we know that uh, we're coming in this world with nothing, and we're going to leave this world with nothing. And so merely we are just stewards of it while, while we are here. Lord, as uh, we take up this offering, we know that uh, you don't need it. You can accomplish your will without it. But, Lord, we do this as a sign of love and obedience and uh, to you, Lord. Lord, I just ask that you bless the gift, bless the giver. May it be used to further your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I think this may be my girls, at least my daughters, Hannah and Kaylee. I think it may be their favorite, this one. When my eyes see your face and my knees bow to your grace and my hands are raised and my lips Sing your praise, oh glorious day, glorious day, that will be glorious day, glorious day, that will be. You gave your life for the wrong I had done, it's a debt I could never repay. Conquered the grave so that I could be saved. Now I wait for that glorious day when my eyes see your face and my knees bow to your grace and my hands are raised and my lips sing your praise. Glorious day, glorious day. That will be a glorious day, glorious day, that will be. We will not all sleep, but we all will be changed in the flash, in the blink of an eye. The trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised, we'll rise to our Lord in the sky. When my eyes see your face and my knees bow to your grace and my hands they are raised and my lips sing your praise, glorious day, oh glorious day, that will be your oh, glorious day, glorious day, that will be. cool things about having to step in at the last minute is you get to do things at the last minute. And uh, I did that at the last minute, and it was kind of fun. And I appreciate you guys uh, indulging me. Um, I like to write songs. I don't know if they're any good, but I enjoy it, and you guys tolerate it, so there we are. Um, okay. There it is. Only problem is I end up trying to think about two things at once and singing the wrong song. <laughs> or uh, trying to remember what I was supposed to preach today. In 1978, anybody remember 1978? I do. 
78, 79 were cool years for me because that's when I started high school. <laughs> I know, and some of you guys are going, oh, I think I had three kids and I've been married for 14 years. I know, I'm sorry. I'm just a pup. 1978, Bob Dylan became a Christian. That's what was cool about 1978 for me. And he received a lot of criticism for becoming a Christian. I mean, he even went so far as to say, yeah, I have been born again. So they started calling him a born again Christian. He took a lot of heat from that, from the community that he had, you know, made his legendary career out of, you know, through the 60s up through the 70s. He was practically a legend already. The entertainment industry turned against him and the Christian community, they wouldn't accept him. You know, good Christians don't sing the songs that you sang, Bob. Good Christians don't look like you do, Bob. Good Christians cut their hair. You know? Good Christians know how to carry a tune, Bob. If you know Bob Dylan, it's carrying a tune's not what he was about. In response to all the criticism, he had this to say in an interview, uh, January 1980. He said, years ago, now, I, tr I thought about doing a Bob Dylan impersonation because he's got such a unique nasally voice, I couldn't do it. So just use your own imagination. Years ago, they said I was a prophet. I used to say, no, I'm not a prophet. And they say, yes, you are. You are a prophet. I said, no, it's not me. They used to say, you're a prophet. They used to convince me I was a prophet. Now I come out and say, Jesus Christ in the, is the answer and they say, Bob Dylan's no prophet. They just can't handle it. That was his response. That's a good response. Despite the criticism of all his newfound faith, he actually won his fourth Grammy in 1979 for his hit single song, You Gotta Serve Somebody. Remember, anybody remember the song, You Gotta Serve Somebody? Yeah. It may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. And, you know, he sang it in his own unique way. I was about 12, I was about 13, I guess, at the time. And I had a couple of thoughts about it. First, when I heard Bob Dylan became a Christian, I thought to myself, how cool is that? You know, I was just waiting for Kiss to become Christians, too. <laughs> or uh, Black Sabbath or one of those other groups I grew up with. I was just waiting for those guys to become Christian, and it didn't happen. But when Bob Dylan became a Christian, I thought, how cool is that? And secondly, when I heard the song, you got to serve somebody, I decided I had to learn the song. You know, you could be a preacher, you could be a banker, you could be a ditch digger, you could be anything you want, but you're going to have to serve somebody was the message of the song. And I mean, it's about a four-minute song, and he lists every occupation and every walk of life in that song at some point. And it always comes back to that same chorus, it may be the devil... Or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody, how he would say it. If you've ever listened to Bob Dylan, you can imagine how hard it was to figure out the melody of that song. You're going to have to serve somebody. It may be the devil. And, and, of course, when he ends the song, he says he's performed it probably a little over a thousand times since then. And he still does it, even though he's changed up the words a lot recently. Um, but at the last time through the chorus, he always does this one thing. It may be the devil or it may be the Lord. Or no, it may be the devil, but it can be the Lord. You're going to have to serve somebody. He changes that one little phrase. Regardless of what you think of Bob Dylan and his music, the truth of the song can't be denied. We all have to serve somebody, and we all have the choice about who we're going to serve. God has given us what we call free will. And we get to choose if we're going to serve or not. We get to choose every single day who we're going to serve. We're going to serve the Lord. Now, realistically, it's what Bob said. There's only two choices. You serve the devil or you serve God. But it might not look that way. Because the devil doesn't look like you think he does and the Lord doesn't look like you think he does. Sometimes the devil looks like you. <laughs> and you're just going to serve yourself. You know, you've got those, you heard about those two old guys. They're sitting at the saloon, and one of them starts laughing. 
He says, look at those two old guys over there. I'm glad that's not us. And the other guy says, that's a mirror. <laughs> Scariest thing in the world is get up about 4 a.m. because you've got to that age where you just can't sleep through the whole night without having to get up and head to the bathroom. And the scariest thing is when you think you see your father in the bathroom mirror. <laughs> it's not your dad, that's you, fella. We all have to serve somebody. It may be the devil, it may be the Lord. As Christians, though, we have surrendered our lives to Christ. It's settled. He is Lord and we serve him, period, right? Like I said, though, the Lord doesn't always look like you think he does, and the devil doesn't always look like you think he does. You see, we've surrendered our lives to Christ, and he's Lord, but the problem is there's other ways to get to you. How do I say this? There is a danger of using the lordship of Jesus Christ as an excuse any time we want to ignore or to disobey other kinds of authority. If you reserve the right to do something or not do something, let me be clear, if you reserve the right to do something or not do something, then you are doing what you want. But as Christians, we pray like Christ prayed in the Garden of Eden, Eden, not my will, Lord, but yours be done. So when I do what I want, I'm doing what I want regardless of what excuse I use. As a Christian, I do not do what I want. I have deferred to Jesus Christ and I do what he wants. It doesn't matter what I want at that point because I have surrendered my life. I have called him Lord and Savior. I gave up my choice to follow him. That's what I mean by this. It's not an excuse to ignore other people. It's also not an excuse to do what you want. You don't get to call it God's will when it's what you want. It doesn't matter what I want anymore. It really doesn't matter what I want. It matters what does Christ compel me to do. That's all that matters. The only biblical reason we have on this earth in this life, the only biblical reason we have to disobey an earthly authority is when that earthly authority would force us to disobey God. Let me say it again. The only biblical reason we have to disobey earthly authority is when that earthly authority would cause us to disobey God. And that is it. Any other reason you have for disobeying any other kind of authority is on you. Only when it causes you to disobey God should you disobey another authority that has rightfully been placed above you. Any other reason is on you. We could probably stop right there and you say, Trace, that's heavy enough. I've had, that's good. We go home. I've got more than I can chew on for the next week. Let's stop right there. But I'm not going to. <laughs> it's not far enough. It's a good word, but it's not far enough. You see, it's not enough to follow God's authority over earthly authority. If that's all it's about, you're going to fall short because there is more to it. It is not enough to follow God's authority over earthly authority. Not only are we to do God's will above everything else, but everything else that we do is to be done in the Lord's name. That's a little different than just ignoring earthly authority and doing God's will. Everything we do is supposed to be done in God's name. You think I'm making this up? Let me tell you how the Apostle Paul said it. Colossians 3, starting at verse 17, he writes this. He says, And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. That's a little bit more than just ignoring earthly authority to follow God. So it's not enough just to do that. You have to decide that what you're going to do, whatever that is, you could do it in the name of the Lord. That's the command. He didn't say, hey guys, it's a nice idea. 
Or, hey, guys, can I suggest? Or, you know, if you're up for it, you might try this. That's not what he's saying. He's saying whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. That's more than just saying, I'm going to follow God and not do what the earthly authority says. That's more. And then he says this, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. After establishing that everything we do is to be done in the name of the Lord Jesus, everything. I mean, Lord, so I can brush my teeth in the name of Jesus? <laughs> I think probably you can. Sounds as silly as it is. Everything we do is to be done in the name of the Lord. And I'm going to harp on that one in a minute some more. But so after he establishes this one maxim, all right, this one thing has to be there, okay? He says this, and it makes the rest of this sound like details, because it is. If everything you do, do in the name of the Lord. And in verse 18, he says, wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting to the Lord. Well, it shouldn't be an issue for anybody that's going to do everything in the name of the Lord anyway. So he didn't pull this out of thin air and decide to pick on women for a moment. Then he said, husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Well, if you're going to do everything in the name of the Lord, why would you want to be harsh with anybody? Why wouldn't you want to love your wife? See, it's not that big a deal. It's details. Verse 20, children, obey your parents in everything. For this pleases the Lord. Well, kids, if you're already doing everything in the name of the Lord, this is just details. This is no big deal. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged, dead. If you're already doing, if you're already parenting your children in the name of the Lord, this is details. Bond servants. Older translations say slaves. And thank goodness we don't have that anymore. At least not in the form it was for so many years obey everything those who are in what he says bond servants obey in everything those who are your earthly masters not by way of eye service as people pleasers but with sincerity of heart fearing the Lord well if you're already doing everything in the name of the Lord what's the problem and then verse 23 takes it just a tiny bit further, a little different aspect. He says, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you'll receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he's done. There is no partiality. All right, let's jump into this a little more. There are several specific instructions to several different categories of people in this passage. If you examine what Paul's saying, it just boils down to these two things, though. First, do everything that you do in the name of the Lord. And secondly, you are serving Christ in everything that you do. Period. That's it. Nothing else. It's kind of one of those simple things. I thought about it a long time. It's like when Jesus said, you know, uh, you know, love the Lord your God, serve him only, and love your neighbor as yourself in these two are the whole of the law. Well, in these two things is the whole of how we treat each other, how we behave around each other. Do everything in the name of the Lord, and you are serving Christ in everything that you do. We all got to serve somebody, and as Christians, the matter is settled. We serve the Lord. The question is, how can I make sure that I am serving the Lord? What do I, how can I make sure that I'm serving the Lord in a given situation? Because sometimes it's just not clear, is it? Well, this passage gives us a litmus test. And when you're unsure about what you should do or what you should say, or if you should do or say something in a certain situation, there's three questions you should ask yourself that this passage, this passage pretty much raises. First one is this, can I do it in the name of Jesus? If you're not sure about whether or not you should do something, the first question you ask yourself is, can I do it in the name of Jesus? Because he says, whatever you do in order to do everything in the name of Jesus. Can I watch that movie in the name of Jesus? Can I speak to my spouse that way in the name of Jesus? 
Can I treat my parents this way in the name of Jesus? Can I talk about my boss or these people in the name of Jesus? Can I say that? Did you hear what so-and-so did in the name of Jesus? You know how ridiculous some of that would sound? You know? You think you could go to a, watch a pornographic film in the name of Jesus? You can't do that. You can't besmirch God's name that way. So the first question you ask yourself when you're not sure what to say or do next is, can I do this in the name of the Lord? And if you can't do it in the name of the Lord, don't do it. And if you can do it in the name of the Lord, then do it in the name of the Lord. That's a tall order, I know. It's easier said than done. That doesn't change our responsibility. Because this command is both inclusive and exclusive. It's inclusive because it tells us that everything that we say and do should be done in the Lord's name. But it's exclusive because by implication, it tells us that we should only do those things that we can say and do in the name of the Lord. If you can't do it in the name of the Lord, don't do it. And if you can, then do that. If you can say it in the Lord's name, say it. If you can't say it in the Lord's name, don't say it. It's simple. I think anything worthwhile is tough. And this is one of those things that's probably tough. You're going to get what you put into it. It's not easy, but it's worth it. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting to the Lord. Can you do that in the name of the Lord? If you can do, if you can't do it, don't do it. Husbands, love your wives and don't be harsh with them. Can you do that in the name of the Lord? Can you do with your spouse this, you know, what you did this morning in the name of the Lord? Can you speak to them how you spoke to them this past week in the name of the Lord? If you can't, don't do it. If you can, speak it and it will be a blessing. Children, obey your parents and everything for this pleases the Lord. Can you disobey mom and dad in the name of the Lord? Probably not. In fact, kids, if you really want to be the ultimate rebel, be a good kid and obey your folks. It'll make you different than every other kid you know. It's the funny thing about when you want to be different from everybody else. All the, I, I used to see it mostly in junior high. All the kids, they want to be so much different from everybody else, and the more they try to be different, they all look like, this, you know, they all become the same. <laughs> you know, it's just it's funny to me. I, I was there. I'm no different. So, you know, if I'm laughing at you, I'm also laughing at me, and that's fine. I'm a funny guy. So are you. Fathers, don't provoke your children. When it comes to your parenting, if you can't do it in the name of the Lord, don't do it. And if you must do it, make sure you do it in the name of the Lord. Your employee or your employer, whatever you can do in the name of the Lord, do it. And if you can't do it in the name of the Lord, don't do it at work. So that's the first question. Can I do it in the name of the Lord? The second question is down in verse 23. Whatever you do, work heartily for the Lord. And then that last statement in verse 24 says, you are serving the Lord Jesus or the Lord Christ. So the question there is, who am I trying to please? If you're not sure about what you should say or do next, you need to ask her, who am I trying to please by saying or doing this? There's really only two choices. I'm either trying to please God or I'm trying to please the devil. I'm telling you, God doesn't look like you think he looks, and the devil doesn't look like you think he looks. Probably comes to a shock to you, but I'm just not always the most lovable and irresistible bundle of joy that you see before you today. Ask my wife. Doesn't sound possible, does it? Do you know... What my wife usually does to me on those days when I'm less than lovable and irresistible. I didn't ask you what I deserve for her to do to me. I asked you what, do you know what she actually does? This sounds silly to some of you, but she does the same thing she does every other day. Why would she do that? Well, here's why, because two wrongs don't make a right. If I'm mistreating her, if I'm behaving badly around her, she's too smart to justify it by doing something bad back to me. She's too smart for that. 
I'm not, but she is. Or I wouldn't be acting bad in the first place. I have to get it on the second or third attempt, finally figure it out. She's not going to justify my bad behavior by behaving badly herself. That's the first reason that she's going to do what she does every other day. Second, and more importantly, she knows this. She is not serving me. She is serving Christ. Yep. This is one of the ways Jesus looks. By serving your spouse, you are serving Christ. Children, by serving your parents, you are serving Christ. Fathers, by encouraging your children, you are encouraging Christ in them. Wives, you're serving Christ. Husbands, serving Christ. Children, serving Christ. Fathers are serving Christ. Employees, you are serving Christ. You might have the worst boss in the world. But by doing a good job, you are serving Christ. And by doing a bad job, you're serving him poorly. And that boss may not deserve your best, but Christ does. How are you serving Christ? Well, I tell you what, I think most of these people know that you're a Christian. And if they don't, already shame on you. You will either be their motivation for following Christ or their excuse not to follow Christ by how you behave around them. And that's the third question. Is God my excuse or my motivation? Is God the reason I do things? You know, is the excuse, is he, is the excuse for my behavior or is he the motivation for my behavior? It is wrong to use God as an excuse for sin, for laziness, for shoddy work, for a lack of commitment to a job well done. An excuse is something we use to deflect blame and avoid responsibility. And if we're not responsible, then we don't have to question our actions, and we certainly don't have to change anything about ourselves because, hey, I'm blaming somebody else. It's not my fault. I'm not responsible. That's just saying I'm not changing. I'm not listening to you, and I'm not changing. That's what that says. And if you want to have the victim mentality, that's fine. But you're going to find yourself a very isolated person. God's name and God's word should never be used as an excuse for our actions, but we've adopted several phrases to do just exactly that, and maybe you even used some of them yourself. Don't kill me. I'm just the messenger. Don't kill me. I'm doing, don't hurt me. I'm just the messenger. Here's another one. Well, if the truth hurts, you mean you're going to use the truth? You're going to use whatever as an excuse to hurt people, to justify causing pain in somebody's life? Basically, you're just getting enjoyment out of their pain is what you're doing. Shame on you. You can't do that in the name of Jesus. You know that. Here's one. I was just following orders. Today, we call that the Nuremberg defense. Anybody remember Nuremberg from your World War II history? That's the excuse that that Nazi soldiers used to excuse their treatment of the Jews in the Holocaust. Just following orders, it's not my fault. But my idea, I'm just doing what I'm told. (laughs) I still hung, and rightly so. Here's another one. This is when we start to, you know, this is a sophomoric understanding of scripture, the person that uses this one, because you know what sophomore means? Huh? It's from two Latin words. You're not a sophomore anymore, I know, but you were one, and so was I. But anyway, sophomore comes from two Greek or two, two Latin words, sophos and moros. Sophos means wise or wisdom, and moros means fool, foolish. So sophomore means a wise fool. That's somebody who knows just enough to get themselves in trouble. Somebody with a sophomore understanding of, Christ, of, of, of Scripture will use this. Judge not lest ye be judged. I remember watching a movie of this guy. He lost his job as a big CEO or a big, you know, big 
officer in some giant company, and he had to get a job, you know, minimum wage somewhere, but he still had his, his BMW 7 Series, which is, you know, big giant $150,000 BMWs, and he's still driving it to work, and he's walking out there as he gets fired because, of course, he's not fit for, you know, real work. And uh, the employees are all looking at him because they had to kick him out of the store. And he walks up to the car, and they all look at him because he's got this giant BMW. And he says, he says, it's just a lease, as if that's an excuse for why he's driving $150,000 automobile at minimum wage. He's just telling people, don't judge me. Don't judge me. You know, one of the things that's funny, when somebody screams that, the fact is they've already judged themselves, haven't they? If they didn't already know, they wouldn't have to be telling you, would they? You really don't have any argument to have to make at that point because they already know they're wrong or they wouldn't be screaming, don't judge me. Another one in that line is, whoever was without sin, let him cast the first stone. That line gets abused. Somebody else's action is not an excuse for your action. When you finally see God at judgment, he's not going to say, what did old so-and-so do? Well, Lord, let me tell you. No, he's not going to ask any about that. He's going to, you know what? I don't care what anybody else did. I want to know, what did you do? Well, but Lord, they did. And he says, I didn't ask you about that. I'm asking, what did you do? Oh, but Lord, you weren't there. <laughs> I'm omnipotent and omniscient and omnipresent. I was there and I saw everything. So be truthful with me. Why'd you do that? Well, Lord, you don't understand. Yeah, I do. But you don't understand the temptation, Lord. And I goes, oh, yeah. I'm the only one who ever existed that knows how far temptation can go because at a certain point with temptation, you gave in and I never did. I went the distance. I went further than temptation can go. So I know exactly how hard temptation is. I know exactly how far it can go. You're the one that doesn't understand. So don't leave that excuse with me. It is wrong to use God's name God's will, God's word as an excuse, and is wrong to use God to try to justify sin. History is replete with terrible crimes that have been committed in the Lord's name. Usually, you know, it's ungodly people who will invoke God to justify their evil ways. And this could be taking God's name in vain, and it's a violation of the second commandment to not do that. These people, instead of being guided by God's word, they twist God's word to suit their own selfish desires. And, and there's some infamous examples. You know, there's the Inquisition in the Middle Ages. Burning witches. Heretics, you know, calling them heretics and burning them at the stake. Slavery. Racism, sexual abuse by Catholic priests. I mean, they just go on and on and on with all the crimes that have been committed by those who claim to be people of God and doing God's will and justifying their actions. I might do this, but it's because I'm this, you know, and I'm so good in God that I've got to, yeah, God doesn't buy that, and you shouldn't either, not with yourself or anyone else. A husband who invokes God's word to justify mistreating his wives, because after all, the Bible said, wives should submit to their husbands. So you husbands got to be some kind of tiny little Napoleon in the home. And you abuse your power like that. And you wonder why you have such trouble with your marriage. You're supposed to love your wife as Christ loves the church and gave himself up for her. Jesus is not Lord of all because he's bigger and more powerful and can whip you if he wants to. He's Lord of all because he earned it. And husbands, if you want to be the Lord of your house, you better earn it. A wife who invokes God's name to justify despising her husband. Well, you know he's got all these faults. He's not worth listening to. You know how men are. I mean, just whatever you're going to say. And you wonder why your husband has trouble loving you. Because you're just not being very loving, lovable. You know, somebody says, a child who uses God's word to justify their rebellion. Well, we're supposed to obey God rather than men. <laughs> or, uh, <laughs> here's the one I used. Mom, Jesus disappeared for three days and his mom and dad didn't do this to him. 
you know, all kinds of excuses. A father who uses God's word to justify abusing or provoking and discouraging his children after all. You know what the Bible says, spare the rod and spoil the child, so I'm going to beat this kid till he gets it right. That's an abuse. An employee who uses God's word to justify poor work. Well, I work for God, not for you, fella. An employer who abuses his employees. The Bible says, obey your master. These kinds of evil give God and the church a bad name. And Paul writes to the Galatians when he says in chapter 6, verse 7 of Galatians, he says, don't be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will reap the flesh of corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will reap eternal life. All right, let's wrap it up. Wives, we husbands aren't always the kind of husbands that we're supposed to be. We're just not the kind of men we should be. And, and hopefully we're better than we used to, but we're not there yet. And we're just not always great guys. So we misbehave and, and, you know, we get bad moods. And we probably don't deserve to be honored and respected the way scriptures say that you're supposed to honor and respect us. But Jesus does deserve it. And you are serving Christ. Husbands, our wives aren't always as lovable as we'd want them to be. And they're not perfect either. But Jesus is. And you are serving Christ. Children, your parents are certainly not perfect. But Christ is. And you are serving Christ. Fathers, your kids are not always perfect. You know why? They have too much of you in them. But Christ is perfect. And you are serving Christ. And your boss, <laughs> he may seem like the spawn of the devil. And I've had a couple that were like that. But you are serving Christ. It may be the devil, but it could be the Lord. You're going to have to serve somebody. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you so much that you give us your word to lay out so clearly some of those things that should be obvious or elementary to us but are so, so hard to follow. Lord, I pray that you give us the strength of conviction to follow you, to serve you. Lord, give us a conviction, give us a determination to make sure that what we do and say, we can do it and say it in your name. And give us the self-discipline if we can't to not do it father i ask that you help us and be mindful and remember every moment of every day that that we are serving you that you are the focus of all of our efforts father help us to remember we don't always know what you look like and sometimes we don't know what the devil looks like so everything should be done in your name. Everything should be done in service to you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. But to service. Maybe you haven't been serving your spouse the way you should. You need, maybe you haven't been serving your kids in a godly way. I, I, I got to admit, I've said one or two things to my kids that I'm certainly glad I didn't do it in the Lord's name or I'd be in trouble. But we repent, we turn away from those things. We make a commitment not to be what we used to be. We confess Jesus as Lord, that is, we declare that it's not my will, Lord, but yours be done. If you've never taken those two steps, it's a good time now.